He's saying that something exists that is not material. And what is materialism? The ideology that all that exists is mass and energy. And if that can be shown to be false, then the whole world of secular humanism is also false. Now I want to show you a possible contradiction, because some of you might be thinking about this. Possible contradiction. Something material cannot create something non-material. That was our scientific law one. Something material cannot create something non-material. Scientific law two says information is non-material. Therefore, how can humans which are material create information if it is non-material? Whoa, did we just contradict ourselves? Not to worry. God is good. Are we just a collection of chemicals as evolutionists teach? Because that's exactly what they're teaching in our schools today. They're teaching our first graders they're just, chem just chemicals. Well, the wonder of being human, our brain and the mind. Eccles, PhD in neurophysiology and Robinson, PhD in psychology, write this. Eccles and Robinson discussed the research of three groups of scientists all of whom produce startling and undeniable evidence that a mental intention preceded an actual neuronal firing. Some of you may not quite see that, but... Thereby establishing that the mind is not the same thing as the brain, but is a separate entity altogether. Ooh... Let's take it to the next one. This gets more exciting as we go along here. Norman Cousins, in interviewing John Eccles, Nobel Prize ph physiologist, says this. As I remarked earlier, this may present an insuperable difficulty for some scientists of materialist bent. But the fact remains and demonstrated by research that non-material mind acts on material brain. So we are not just chemicals. There's a non-material component to us, and it's demonstrated by research. Now, we've looked at the three general laws of science. Now let me introduce you to two laws of, about information. First law of information. Information cannot originate by random chance processes. Now, how does evolution work? Random chance processes. Does this sound good now? Information cannot arise by random chance processes. In other words, rolling the dice will never produce information. Wow, let's look at this further. Werner Gitt, PhD in physics and information specialist, says this. There is no known law of nature, no known process, and no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. And what is the most key component of evolutionary process? Information. In order for one species or one kind to become a new kind, you must add new functional genetic information. How does evolution work? Random chance processes, but random chance processes never produce what? Information. Are you starting to see the power of information now? Something that's been neglected for many years. Second law of information. Information can only originate from an intelligent sender. Ooh, this is getting more exciting as we go along. Corollary. That was one of those what we call logical inference. Any given chain of information can be traced backward to an intelligent source. In other words, the information in this book, there's a lot of information in this book, but the book is not the source of information. We can trace it back to its originator. In this case, Dr. Werner Gitt. Okay, now, the teacher in me says it's time for a review. We've covered quite a bit, and we're getting closer to those conclusions. Number one, we were presented the challenge. The church was challenged that they cannot defend against materialism. Are you starting to see we've already broken some of that down? We established the good news that no one has an excuse for not believing in a creator. That's why we need to go out there and tell people about this, that there is a creator, and that creator died on the cross for us. We've established a universal definition of information. We have seen it works in technological systems. But does it work in living systems? We see it works with the laws of science. But now, let's go to the last part. Does it really work in living systems? Because if it doesn't, it's not universal.
DNA. Let's go to our DNA. All living organisms contain a molecule called DNA. It's the fundamental part of life there. Does the DNA code found in DNA fit our universal definition? Well, let's start here. The decoded portion of information DNA contains what? Four letters, A, T, C, and G. Letters, what do letters connotate? We might have a code. So let's look at the DNA code, those four letters. Words are comprised of three letters. We have four possible letters, but the words called codons are comprised of three letters. So it has a code. Does it have meaning? Well, each three-letter DNA word, a codon, represents one of the 20 different amino acids used in life. So it has meaning. Each word represents a physical amino acid. So, so far we have a code and we have meaning. Is there an expected action? The cellular proteins are essential for construction, function, maintenance of reproduction in the entire organism. In other words, without those proteins, guess what happens? See, we get the amino acids, bring them in, and the amino acids build the proteins, get the proteins put together, and those are essential for life. Because they, they do a lot of work in there. And then, is there a purpose? Yes, the purpose of all this, the DNA, is what? The existence of life. So when we look at all this, we can see that the DNA, the information encoded into our DNA, meets our universal definition. It has a code, it has meaning, has an expected action, and it has an intended purpose, which was, again, the existence of life. You know what happens if you take your DNA out of you? You're not producing any more what? Amino acids. You don't produce any amino acids, you don't get any proteins for doing any work. And then what happens? We're dead. Furthermore, ah, there's a furthermore here. The capacity and density of the information encoded in DNA surpasses anything mankind has accomplished. Let's examine that. John Sanford, PhD in genetics, entropy and the mystery of the genome. Wonderful book, wonderful book. It's called one of those semi-technical books. Don't worry about the name, it's only semi-technical. We bring a few with us. There is no information system designed by man that can even begin to compare to DNA. Hmm, if mankind can't do it, I wonder who did. Let me, let me show you how smart we are today. We're pretty smart today. Here's a 340 gigabyte hard drive. Does that mean anything to anybody? Some of you. Some of you, maybe not. 340 gigabyte. What we're saying there is we can take something about this size and put 340 billion pieces of information on it. Wow, we are smart. We're the only generation in all the history of mankind that's been able to do something like that. So we are definitely the smartest generation that's ever lived on this planet, according to us. <laughs> wow, that is smart, how we can encode information. But let's look at DNA. Let's look at the DNA that's in, the information encoded in our DNA. When we take the measurements, we find that the information encoded in DNA is over 5 billion times more compact than what we can do with a hard drive. Now, we're not so smart, are we? Anybody like mathematics here? There's part of the calculations. That'll get you salivating there, too. That's just a part of the calculations we did. We actually went out there and did all the mathematics and calculations of this. It came out to be over 5 billion times more compact. Let me put that in picture. If we were to take a 2 by 2 inch square chip, just a square chip, two inches by two inches, and put DNA all over that two by two inch chip. How many Bibles could that cover? That would be enough to encode 7.7 .7 million million Bibles on that two by two inch chip. That's how compact the information is in your DNA. That is enough Bibles to go from the earth past the sun when they're stacked up. That's DNA. Now remember, Information never arises by random chance processes. And always points back to an intelligent sender. We're getting close to these conclusions. Now, how long would it take using evolution or random chance events to type out such a code? John Joe McFadden, PhD in molecular genetics, wrote a book called Quantum Evolution, describes it. And this man is an evolutionist. And he says, a billion universes, each populated by billions of typing monkeys, could not type out a single gene of this genome. <laughs> <laughs> it 
So now, we've got this DNA thing here. It's compact with information. And information only comes from an intelligent sender. And this information DNA is greater than anything mankind has ever made. I wonder who encoded that information. I think you see where we're leading now. We're almost to these conclusions. Since all living systems contain DNA, and DNA meets the definition of information, we can now draw seven very strong conclusions. Number one, since the DNA code of all life forms is clearly within the universal definition of information, we can now say, we conclude there